This episode is brought to you by Camille Najat with Exit Realty Metro. Camille Najat is an experienced real estate agent who prides herself in finding the perfect home for her clients. Camille can help you with a comparative market analysis to help determine the value of your home if you're planning on selling, or help you determine the going rate for the neighborhood you're moving into. She can also work with you at your pace. You can reach Camille by calling 902-880-8429 or email Camille at exitmetro.ca. Also, you can find her on Facebook at Camille Najat Exit Realty Metro. This is Matt Conrad. And this is Mike Tobin. Welcome to the Afternoon Pint. This week we speak with Jordy Morgan. Jordy is a well-known radio and television broadcaster in Nova Scotia, Canada. He's had a run in politics and is currently Vice President of Atlantic Government Relations for Restaurants Canada. Enjoy. I like this as an opener. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Afternoon Pint. I'm Mike Tobin. I'm Matt Conrad. And we have... Jordy Morgan. And as I was saying, we, uh, you may have heard that voice before because Jordy has been on the radio and I've been listening to Jordy for quite a while on News 95.7, which we will get into. But, uh, cause well, you've at least you didn't say my dad used to listen to you on C100 or when he was a kid. So no, we can, we, I get that too. <laughs> we, we can, yeah, we will dive into that because you, you have had a, uh, a, like a nice long, long career over, uh, over radio and, yeah. uh, uh, you know, starting back with uh, CBC. In the 90s, I think. Well, it that, actually probably. it winds back to 1977 when yeah. I went to radio school in the old Trademark building, which is where the Department of Education is in the corner of Brunswick and okay. Cogswell. Oh, okay. So that's 97. And I left, and, or sorry, seven, 97. 77. 77, yeah. uh, And left and went to go to Bathurst, New Brunswick okay. to do my penance there for two years. <laughs> And then subsequent to that, went to St. John, and then went to the Valley, and then I came to see 100, and, well, I think it's called Move 100 now. And so, yeah. yeah, did uh, 10 years there as Okay, well. I, I noticed on your resume, I, I checked you out there too on LinkedIn. <laughs> uh, back in 83, uh, Much Music, City TV, what, yeah. was, what was the story back there? It was 83, 85 or something? Uh, yeah, I think it was around 85. It, it was funny because I went to go see... 299 Queen Street West the other night, which is the film that Sean Menard has done about much music. Mm. And what was happening is because I worked for C100 at the time, it was owned by Chum. Mm -hmm. And Chum was also the ownership body for much music when it began. And uh, what they did in Atlantic Canada, or for Atlantic Canada, they had, they, Terry David Mulligan had a show in Vancouver, but he was really well established as kind of as a BC guy. So he was doing stuff out in Vancouver, and they had um, uh, me doing what they called a stringer job. So basically I was a reporter for Much Music, and they did a, they did a call out across for different chum radio stations, and I, I did an audition which I think was suitably horrible. And, <laughs> and somebody took a nice picture of me and sent it up to much. And um, yeah, so anyway, I, got, I, I did much for three or four years. Just, cool. you know, it was basically going out to concerts and interviewing people and I would send it up. And um, there was a, a, a part of much music called Rock Flash where Kim Clark Champness was the guy who hosted that and Denise Donald did it for a while. And they would take little, you know, stories from... Uh, Halifax or wherever I managed to travel. Sometimes I went to PEI, sometimes to New Brunswick, but mostly it was Halifax. I think the first one I did was I went down and I recorded a band called uh, The October Game. And that band was playing at the YWCA on Barrington Street and had a lead singer whose name was Sarah McLaughlin. Oh, no. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> and that was the first thing she, I said. She turned into kind of a big deal. Yeah, she she sort of, <laughs> she did all right for herself. So. Yeah, yeah, anyway, exactly. yeah, so that's how old that goes back. Amazing. So that's like mid-80s or something. That's cool. Yeah, anyway, and sorry to go on about this, no, but no, it, the film that we I went to go see it at the Rebecca Cohn, and like Mike Campbell, who was a really good buddy of mine, he was had a show called Mike and Mike's Excellent Cross-Country Adventures, and he was also much east and that stuff. Anyway, they had uh, Erica M. and Mike and a couple of other folks, Sean Menard, 
and Rick the Temp. Yes, they, have yeah, a little, yeah. they have a little panel, and then it's it's a really worthwhile movie to see if you watched much music back in the eighties and nineties. For sure. Uh, and what is really striking about it was the cultural significance that much music had in the music industry and its impact on the music industry in Canada. So uh, it's going to be airing on Crave okay. sometime in the next little while, but they've been touring it across the country. Yeah, I saw it was, yeah, I was here at, yeah. at the Rebecca. My Cone. buddy went, he said it was fantastic. He, he really enjoyed it. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, it basically is just a bunch of archival uh, material. They, and Sean did a really neat job because he just took voice track of uh, people from much like Erica and uh, Mike and Mike Williams and all those sorts of folks that you might remember and just used their voice track and then did used a lot of archival footage and it, it told that sort of that story arc of how it began and how why 299 Queen Street West which is the address of the building why that was such an important fixture mm. very it's, cool it, yeah I mean as a I mean, born in the 80s, but grew up in the 90s. Much, much music was like it was a thing. The like fixture, was, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, that's what I did on, like, the countdown and everything was just, you're obsessed to see who's going to land on the first. <laughs> yeah. And, and then what was cool about the 90s, too, is, like, the about much music is, is um, the countdown wasn't just occupied solely by pop music. Like, you could turn on there and, like, you could hear Nine Inch Nails. and You were introduced to extremes on all sides. You could hear of music. Yeah. yeah. 100%. Yeah, there's a really interesting part of the movie where um, David Bowie is talking with one of the guys from MTV. And Bowie says, like, why do you not play black music on uh, MTV? And the, the whole, then Mark Goodman, who was the VJ, he tries to explain, well, you know, we're trying to get a certain audience and all this stuff. And you can see Bowie sort of looking at him, kind of going... <laughs> Right. Okay, we get this. And, you know, there was, there was an, in the 80s, I don't think people remember when album radio was happening, there was really an inherent racism because black music really never made its way onto album radio until Michael Jackson started right. making an appearance, right. right? And then you started to see a little bit more um, acceptance of soul. And the, and the weird thing about that was that when Top 40 radio was really at its prime, and I'm going back into the late 60s, early 70s, and that kind of stuff, where I grew up with, when I grew up with radio, is that they played all kinds of different music, right? There, mm -hmm. there, was, there was, you know, everything from classical gas to Motown, you know? I right. mean, it was, it, was a, it was a very broad range of, of uh, musical genres. And then when album radio became prominent on FM in the early 1980s, it, it really kind of homogenized okay. this into yeah. either, you know, a hard metal uh, sort of a format or this sort of soft rock thing and this weird move away from soul. And it took really into the late 1980s to get back into it. And in Canada, I th this is one point I think you made, is that uh, much music... They would play anything. They didn't depend on radio, right? They yeah. didn't care. And there, there was kind of a feedback loop there where if much was on it, then maybe radio should get on it. So it, it really served to, I think, diversify. Oh, cool. Okay. You know, yeah. in Canada, it diversified radio all the way around. So it was a you know, very, very positive influence. Yeah, it seemed that way. I mean, like, I, I always found that, uh, it, yeah, our radio slash, um, you know, Video. They were saying, you know, the, the, the whole video killed the radio star type of thing, right? The first <laughs> video ever launched on MTV, right? And the internet um, killed it, the albums. Oh, <laughs> honestly, it's so now crazy it's just now. Singles. <laughs> well, it's now it's just yeah. singles, but I mean, when you think about it now, it's like, uh, I, you would have thought video would have been the next big thing, and it was for a little while, but I mean, I don't even know why they make music videos anymore outside of YouTube, but even still. Mm. Just well, play the song. Right? Yeah, well, there, I mean, you know, Spotify obviously has made a huge difference. In the, you know, yeah. if, if you want to go back to, you know, the beginning of kind of that ability to, um, to you know, get MP3s on demand when they've started out. But uh, YouTube, I think, spelled the end of much music as we knew it because I don't think they felt that they there was really any uh, urgency for it. Right. When people mm. wouldn't wait around for a video to be released. I mean, if the new Madonna video is out on YouTube, you know, and you pop it up on your computer or now on your mobile device, I mean, right. you know, what's the purpose, right? Yeah. So they, they lost their identity, and then they tried to 
you know, they got into this whole thing about reality shows. Oh gosh, and, yes. I mean, it just was like, it just got so bad. And the one thing about much when it was cool, it was because it was cool. Right. And then it completely lost its cool. So there was no reason, you know, to watch it. So it, it had to reinvent it itself as some other content channel. So... Um, I remember in the end days of cable, I was watching much <laughs> more music, uh, more than I was watching much music, because they were actually playing music. That's and right. If you, yeah, could, you put more, on yeah. much music, there was nothing right. on there. At least on much more music, you'd hear some songs and some different artists. Yeah. Right? At the very least, they, they, they were hanging on to it with the uh, much uh, music video dances and things yeah. like that a little yeah. bit. Right? Just, yeah. yeah. But then again, you don't have people... That always I found to be weird too, because then you it's like, what are you trying to achieve here? Because are you trying to get people to dance, or do you have people trying to stand around, stand at a big screen? <laughs> Junior high, the they had. I remember they used to start the much music video dance party. It would just be a hundred kids staring oh, at no. a TV like yeah, it was, that was uh, a big deal. Yeah. Like you know, you'd have a like DJ come down and you'd play videos, and then people would just ah, yeah, people great. were barely dancing. They were yeah. just watching their music videos for the first time. Some of them saw videos people kids had never seen before, so they were just <laughs> staring yeah. at the screen the entire. Time. Time. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure there are like some some millennial kids listening to this going, "I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> what do they mean by that?" <laughs> you know, it's like try to explain everybody sitting around listening to a b- baseball game on the radio, right? It's like it, it's an yeah. entire. It's just you know people are living in such an entirely different universe now. Sure, isn't and that it's, the truth? it's fun? It's fun to be an antique sometimes. Yeah, that's true. And I mean, it's funny. I mean, like you know, we're. You know, we're we're in our late thirties, uh, and uh, I'm starting to feel that way. Where it's like, remember when this existed, kind of thing. It's uh, I don't know. I I, I I like our generation though, just because you know we we can remember uh, things that predate the internet, or at least you know when the internet sounded like you know when you picked up the phone and it screeched in your ear, kind of thing. Yeah. So we remember what it was like to be going outside all the time and not have to rely on those things. And video games were only played on a rainy day. But now we also are not, com- you know, completely oblivious to how technology works, type of thing too. So, I remember I went when I was at the CBC, which I started in uh, 1990 there, and I started just filling in, basically on CBC television on the weekends and stuff, reading newscasts and whatnot. And I got a call one day saying, "Look, can you fill in for somebody on News World?" And I, uh, yeah. Anyway, that that remarkably turned into a job. It was there's a long, <laughs> sordid kind of story that um, that precedes that, which I don't need to uh, burden you with. But uh, so I start, I was working for News World, and they were looking for somebody uh, to fill in on the morning show doing sports and weather. And I went, yeah, well, you know, I can do that. How tough can that be, really? You know. So I had a sports producer, and then I. I pretty much knew how to read a weather forecast from 20 years in radio so um i uh i started doing this weather th- this weather thing and eventually eventually and i think it was 93 there was i got this i was working one day and i got this call from this guy he says hi i'm with uh, you know i'm with the weather network and uh what we're doing is we're putting together uh kind of a group of canadian weather forecasters who are going over to a weather forecasting convention in Paris, cool. And I, and I, and I'm like, that sounds ridiculous, yeah, but awesome. Okay. I said, so what? So what does that mean? They said, well, we'll fly over there, Air France. We'll put you up for a week in a hotel. And strangely enough, like weather is a big deal in Europe, right? Mm-hmm. Like, they, like they treat their weather forecasters like stars over there. And okay. I'm sort of, I'm sort of thinking, wow, yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, like I got a flight. And uh, my wife at the time, my wife or girlfriend at the time, I can't remember if we were, I guess we were probably married. Uh, yeah, okay, so uh, we'll go over there. And we spent a week in uh, Paris. And they had this whole, like, they had, like, seminars and all of this sort of stuff. And then they, they had, like, this night with, like, a red carpet thing. And there was, like, media there and the, I mean it was it was like wow. it wasn't quite the Oscars or you yeah. know the European Music Awards but it was big enough yeah. <laughs> I think it was on television and, <laughs> and all this kind of stuff and um, went over there and you know had this whole kind of weather experience and talked to other weather people and whatnot and what but anyway what what I was getting at is at one point we're having one of these seminars, and there's a guy there from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, which is the American Weather Service, right? Mm-hmm. Anyway, 
it was like in between. It was like at lunch or whatever, and we're standing around, and I smoked at the time. We're out, you know, having a smoke, and, and he goes, uh, "Yeah, so uh, are you guys on the uh, on on the World Wide Web?" And I looked at him. Uh, <laughs> What are you talking about? He goes, well, there's a bunch of computers, and they're linked up, and it's all this sort of stuff. And I said, this is well, 93. this is like 93, right? <laughs> so cool. I said, uh, no. And he said, yeah, this is going to be the thing, right? And I said, well, why? He says, well, you can instantaneously share information. And, let, and I'm kind of like going... I have no idea what you're talking about. Like, wow. you know, this was this was only happening in universities, right. you know. And basically, what he was talking about was the uh, the link up between universities at the time. And if you look at early internet stuff, anyway. So I trot back, to, you know, after our <laughs> weather celebration in Paris, I trot back to uh, Halifax and I said, "Does anybody here know what the?" World Wide Web is, or <laughs> it's it's called the, like the internet or interweb or whatever it was, and they said, yeah, well, we're starting to hear some stuff about it, and I th I think it was within sort of like two years because we were all working on desktops, but none of the desktops were hooked up to anything because right. except the internal network, right? right. The, the Commodore sixty fours and stuff like that. Was it? Was it? I think we had like two eighty sixes back then, and okay. it, you know, basically, you know, the the yellow monitors and yep. the, the keyboards and stuff, and you were hooked up into an internal network, mm -hmm. and you could send email. That was crazy, yeah. and you know, you could do that kind of stuff because we. I remember we had. Um, you know, we had to write our scripts and stuff on the computer, but it would be fed into a paper thing and then printed off and mm -hmm. whatnot. So, yeah, but but literally within, you know, t I think it was about two years we were working on Mosaic and Netscape and, and actually beginning to incorporate things like little tiny videos and whatnot. I remember the first time I was doing the weather and, and I was actually able to go to the, wet, like the Environment Canada website and they had a... Satellite, they had, they had the the goes east satellite animation available. You'd have to download it, like take mm -hmm. ten minutes, right? But you would get, you know, this tiny little square thing, which would give you a, a live satellite feed from the goes east satellite, live-ish, you know, yeah. delayed by a few minutes. And we decided, okay, well, let's put that on television. And then we started putting websites on television. People would call up and review them and all this sort of stuff. It was just such a weird time because it, you know, that, you know, it was pre Google, it was Netscape and all that kind of stuff. Oh, was, yeah. You know, I mean, my, my, first, my first experience, like, because my, my, we had a, we had a computer at our house because my mother worked, like, when early on, she worked on a computer and all that stuff. And so I remember having, like, a computer, a desktop, and early on, and I remember having to go on DOS. And like that was like the internet, and you had to <laughs> yeah. download images <laughs> off of a DOS, and you're like, I hope this is the right thing that I'm downloading. <laughs> and you just download, and then the picture would just like yeah. slowly come down. Like it would take five minutes to download oh my a picture. Gosh, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. And now we're sitting there tapping our foot to get like some crazy Google oh. search. You know, oh, it's like, yeah. my attention span has like shrunk so much that if it's like. If I have to wait more than <laughs> 0.2 seconds, I'm like, why is this so slow? Well, I was I was super into computers the moment like yeah. Dad brought one home. I think I was in the fifth grade and uh, figured this thing out, and I was just you know obsessed with like playing video. Like you said about having the video, I'd wait you know 10 minutes for this tiny little clip to play, <laughs> right, and just be like, wow, right. And I remember my buddy and I got. Duke Nukem. It was an old shoot 'em up oh, yeah. kind of arcade game. Yeah. And this is the first time you could kind of just do a manhunt against each other, player yeah. versus player, and just go around with your guns and try to shoot each other. It takes us about 40 minutes to set up one game. Right. And, uh, but when, when it worked, it was beautiful. And tie up the phone line, some mom be yelling at us, like, you know, <laughs> get off the. Get off the internet. Yeah. <laughs> like but people yeah. who can't remember what a, what a, <laughs> what a modem science uh, sound, yeah. uh, dial up sounds like. <laughs> it's so cool, right? And where oh, yeah. it is now, and like, I mean, our, my kid is, uh, Gracie's 11, and she's like, you know, so impatient if something's not instantaneously working on the internet. I'm just like, give it time. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, so uh, you spent pretty much all of the 90s at CBC. Uh, yep. which that like that must have been an interesting time to be there. I mean, there was a lot politically that was going on in the '90s. I mean, some really. I mean, some may say, you know, some may say some of the glory days sure. in a lot of ways. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, 
being at News World at that time was really interesting. I mean, the CBC main channel was doing its thing, but what happened, as you'll recall, in the early 90s, the Gulf War broke out, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, News World had taken the role of the 24-hour news network in Canada. I mean, it wasn't clearly as advanced as CNN at the time, but it, I, I mean... There was a philosophy behind it that I really loved. One of the things is that we had the morning show came out of Halifax, and then you would, you know, you would move to Ottawa that had an office, then to Winnipeg, mm. and then to Calgary. So as the time zones went across, the locale of where this stuff was coming out of changed as well. Makes and there sense. was staff in each of these things. So I was really fortunate. I mean, I got to work with some, you know, amazing. Uh, people, Bill Cameron and Henry Champ, and oh my God, there was you know there was a ton of folks that, and I'm you know those were you know, two, you know there was uh, Joanne Stefanik that I worked with, Norma Lee McLeod, and I mean Colleen Jones, and all of these people that are very well known. Um, Mark Kelly, I remember training Mark Kelly for the first time when he was <laughs> he had never done any anchoring before, and that was like a week before the. Uh, Swiss Air Flight went in at Peggy's oh, wow. Cove, okay. right? So uh, there was a lot of stuff that was happening, and uh, Newsworld, you know, be became a really important part of the CBC News infrastructure mm -hmm. uh, because it was able to deliver stuff very, very quickly and became very, very responsive. I mean, we, we were operating out of a trailer behind the CBC building, <laughs> and there was some really, really talented people that were working in there. Uh, super responsive. I, you know, I remember when uh, Diana was killed. Right. I mean, we we mounted, you know, just some unbelievable programming. The Swiss Air thing was another. I mean, when that happened, you know, and the world sort of came down and yeah. focused on Halifax. That, that, and and News World was, you know, instrumental in bringing that stuff, and did as good a job as any major network did in delivering that stuff live, and established a reputation as being. Uh, you know, super responsive and all that kind of stuff. But then it seemed like any, you know, at the CBC, then the main networks, you know, the, the, the administrators, the management, they're all trying to figure out ways to fuck it up. So sorry, but you know, <laughs> it, it eventually uh, kind of transmogrified into the CBC news channel, mm, okay. which then moved to Toronto. And the thing that, uh, that's when I left because I, it, it irritated me to the point that I've just gone, you know, all the politics and all the rest of the stuff, I just, like, I've had enough of this. And, uh, yeah, take it to Toronto. They asked if I wanted to go to Toronto. I said, no, I don't want to move to Toronto. It's not, it's like, it, it became embedded into that kind of um, managerial bureaucracy that CBC uh, tends to make things you know, kind of glom onto. It's not to say that there aren't really great people that work there and continue yeah, to work yeah. there and great journalists and all of that sort of stuff. But it, I was, I was very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I had bought into the idea that there needed to be a regional perspective okay, yeah, and yeah. the idea that it, everything doesn't happen on Front Street in Toronto, and that's where everything needs to come from, right? Mm. Or, 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 you know, Queen Street West or whatever, you know, yeah. that whole downtown Toronto kind of mentality. And it was, that's what really, there was, a, there was a philosophical thing that I thought News World brought to it that they lost. And then, as you saw over a period of time, they got rid of Ottawa and Winnipeg and Calgary, and now, right. you know, everything that is English. Television yeah. comes yeah. out of downtown Toronto. Right? That you know what though? That's actually um, that's really something that has happened to not just the radio not, or not whatever. just CBC. It's, it's, no, not not just uh, not just CBC, not just radio, but other companies. Like we've I've seen this in, in companies that I've worked in in the past and stuff where uh, you know you have a regional you have regional representation, like you know that higher level management, and all of a sudden they say, yeah, you know what. We're going to, this person who runs Ottawa or, you know, maybe Ottawa or Ontario East is going to just take the Maritimes as well. And we'll just, and then you don't have that, uh, you know, that representation of, of senior leadership within here. And they don't get the Maritime mentality. They don't get how Regions do function differently. Regions function differently. Uh, I mean, people like, function differently. Uh, the this, consumer that's functions right. differently. 
And uh, a consumer 100%. in Atlanta, Canada yeah. is far different from a consumer in Ontario. Well, that's the thing. Is and, everyone and thinks, it, like, Quebec I mean, is the different yeah, province. They, they, like, they, frankly, they all might want a product or we're service. all different. I mean, like, the Maritimes, we even though we're different, but the Maritimes still has a mm-hmm. relatively similar mentality. Quebec's different. Ontario's different. You have the Prairies that think differently. Right. And then you have BC that thinks differently. We're all quite different. And I do believe that, yeah, our regional representation is really important. Yeah. And you see, you know, through and look i understand business decisions um yeah and i you know i wrote a fairly lengthy piece uh when rogers decided to downsize i, I, I had been at news 95 7 doing maritime morning for three years and they right. decided that they were going to get rid of the a they were going to get rid of a couple of stations they mm-hmm. got rid of moncton and st john and then uh they decided that they would scale back their staff at News 95.7, and I, you know, it wasn't just me. There was a bunch of other really good people that ended up being fired, and that was in uh, 2013, I guess it was. Yeah, okay. yeah. And the, you know, at the time I said, look, I understand why these business decisions are being made, and you know, I don't, really don't have any hard feelings about it because it's a tough time in the industry and all the rest of it. Where I started to lose faith in. What they're do- is that they've, you know, they've skeletized these operations to a point of almost being non-functional. They are, you know, putting people in positions where it's extraordinarily difficult to do the work, right. uh, and because they're not providing them the resources. And my my feeling about this is, you know, with all this idea that in radio you're going to move to AI and all of this sort of stuff, and is that, you know, the more that you take humans out of this, the less able we're going to be able to actually reflect back mm. our own humanity to ourselves. It's just what yeah. broadcasting is about. It's, a, right. it's supposed well, to be I, about. I, and I just want to second that. Sure. It comes back to that 90s much music thing you were just talking yeah. about. And, and, and you with the, the different music genres, the yeah. perspective, right? Yeah. You might be a, a rock and roll guy, but then all of a sudden much music showed you a hip hop song that sounded really cool. And yeah. you were like, wow, I really like that song. All of a sudden you're, your person is just, you've just gained an entire new perspective. You get that with human interaction. This is the you problem with algorithm. Yeah. <laughs> you don't necessarily get that with, yeah. we know what you like, we know what you like, so we're just going to play more and more and more and yeah. more of it until you're... I, I don't know, maybe. It, it, I, like my, I like what Spotify delivers me, if that's, if that's yeah. an argument for that. No, but, yeah. but the point is that, you know what, if you, in the news, and I'm talking mostly about news here. Sure. Um, and there is a huge conversation that has to be had in this country about what's happening to the news industry. Mm. You know, we have we have a federal conservative party who's sitting there saying, "Okay, we're going to defund the CBC." We have mm. the Liberal Party, which is passing legislation, which is, uh, I mean, is grossly uh, misimagined to the point that you know some of the things that they're doing are causing the bankruptcies. You know, where they're thinking, "Okay, if we do this, then." You know, the, the big one, of course, is when you're talking about if you uh, say to Facebook, OK, well, you know, unless you pay news right. outlets and then Facebook goes, yeah, well, you know, we're not going to do that. We're, we're not, 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 <laughs> not, not going to do it. Yeah. So now you've got people who yeah. are depending on being funneled uh, audience from Facebook to mm. their websites, which is an important part of their model. Right. That's now gone. So, you know, you end up with Metroland in Quebec going bankrupt, throwing, you know, dozens and dozens of journalists out of work. And if they think that this, you know, that they're going to be able to legislate this stuff mm. with this, uh, you know, it, it's, it's unbelievably ill-considered legislation. And People have been screaming from inside, you know, the journalistic community on both sides of this issue. But the, 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 I think that the problem is, is that you're going to end up in a situation where, you know, things become more and more centralized, that you have less and less resources for it. Your, your journalism is going to decay to the point. And if you don't have good information that is coming out from sound journalistic sources, mm-hmm. then what is our country to do in terms of making decisions about what's going on. I mean, there's, that is a deeply disturbing trend that has profound implications for our democracy generally. And I'm, I'm very, very hopeful that coming into this next election, that some of Mr. Polyev's uh, positioning on this about defunding the CBC is going to actually launch a broader discussion Mm. about Okay, what is a public broadcaster supposed to do? What is its role in 
20, the 2020s as opposed to the 2060s, which is where our broadcast act seems to be uh, put in place. What is the CRTC doing? Mm. I mean, you know, the CR, there's legislation now, <coughs> this Online Harms Act, yeah, it, where they're looking at the point the, uh, at a show like this, for example, that if I say something really fucking offensive, like what I just said, mm -hmm. that yeah. they go, okay, well, that actually is no longer meeting our public standards, so therefore, right, uh, you know, and then they go, okay, but no, 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 D don't worry, we're not going to do anything except deal with people who have revenue over ten million right. dollars, we were right? About this yeah, 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 and you're yeah. going. Oh, okay, well, I'm safe. Well, not unless you're distributed on Spotify, and then you become part of the CRTC's new standards mechanism. Right. And so, I mean, this is highly problematic. And when you get regulators starting to look at this stuff in the same way that they do in terms of, you know, people don't understand as well. Like, the, you know, the, in Canada, we have something called this, the Canadian Broadcast Standards Council. That's right. Okay. So that's why you don't hear the F word while you're eating your cornflakes. In the right. Morning, right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You might see it if they give a disclaimer at, at night. Also, we, that's like you have to have a minimum content of Canadian content. I believe. Uh, no, that's the, well, that's CRTC regs. That's, Those okay, are CRTC yeah. regs. It's yeah. just something a little bit different. But the Canadian Broadcast Standards Council is actually a voluntary association oh, okay. that okay. Canadian broadcasters support. Meanwhile, the CBC doesn't participate in that, so they have their own ombudsman program. That's I'm going down a rabbit hole here, but um, I'm just I just want to back up. Maybe I'll back up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Is that I think that as we go into the next election, that I'm really really hopeful that this position that Mr. Polyev is taking about you know lo re looking at what the CBC is will actually. Uh, spark a larger conversation about what's happened in the last couple of years to uh, the legislation that's come through about you know whether it's C11 or C16 these these acts that are that have an implication for journalism generally and these new ones that people are trying to think up so the, because I think we've got to really rethink mm. in the country where our communications uh, policy is going and and how it's going to benefit our country generally going forward because it's 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 too important not to pay attention to. Yeah. And my issue is that I'm, and it was one of the reasons actually when you said you want to come on and talk about this stuff. I I listen to a lot of podcasts and I I really think that they're going to be an, an important form of communication for people. Yes, and I, yeah. uh, I do not want to see, you know our f f federal overlords beginning to meddle in this stuff to the point that we're going to have problems in terms of either distribution or content. Right, because right. if that happens, then we're going to have a real problem. Like you right. do have a, uh, I, I think there should be a freedom for people to listen to this show or any other show that and we've done or anyone else done. And to agree with it or disagree with it wholeheartedly. <laughs> right. They can get mad yeah, at us. Yeah, they can exactly. really not like what we said in that episode. That's right. That's right. Uh, they can move on to the next one. And, uh, but yeah, you're right. You need to have that. This show is doing nothing but shining a light on different people at That's the right. end of the day. Our show is about uh, beer and love. Yeah. In the, in the simplest two words, we just, you know, that's it. That's right? what our next merchandising has to be. It's like hashtag beer and beer love. Beer and love. That's <laughs> it, man. We're just showing love to people and we're having yeah. enjoying a beer. And uh, if, if we're not able to do this show, uh, oh, yeah. Like, I mean, just to think about it and think about how, I mean, good our intentions have been going into this. Absolutely. I mean, you know, it's, it's disgraceful. Yeah. Right. And it's a, uh, it's, it's, it is kind of sad and scary to see. I don't, I don't think the the branding defund the CBC is the best way to start. If I mean, in fairness, if they want to have a broader conversation about media, because the way I think. A lot of people may perceive it just not paying a lot of attention is you look at that and you just say, oh, that's a guy that hates liberals and hates liberal media. Yeah. That's, right. I think, the message that's a take home for a lot of people when they hear that. Now, that's not necessarily, as you just explained very well, you know, what, you know, the bigger conversation could be. And I'd love to have that bigger conversation out there. But I just I, I, I never love uh, uh, there's a lot about uh, Mr. Polyev that I like. Uh, oh, yeah. One thing I haven't liked so far is some of his branding. I'm like, it's a little too harsh because what it does is you're just pissing people off before they're even listening to you. 
And, uh, and that's, that's something that's why that he needs to come on the afternoon. Yeah, point. we really need him on this show. <laughs> we want have him a beer with him and, yeah. and, and talk in mode. Yeah, I really would love to I, have him. I on. honestly think the best thing for him would be to come on this show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> that's a great segue because sure. here's the thing: because Jordy has spent a large portion of his life either on the radio yeah. or involved in politics. Oh, okay. Here we so go. I know you ran. You ran after shortly after you left the CBC or something along those lines, right? Yes, my ill-considered entry into federal politics. Yes, I did with with with, with the Alliance Party, which doesn't exist anymore. Right? Okay, sort of. tell. Guys like me, a little bit about the Alliance of Party. What's that? <laughs> God. <laughs> you, you're no, trying not me to here. get you in any trouble <laughs> here today. I, I promised like you that. PTSD. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you what happened is I was, um, I just, as I said, I just spent 10 years at the CBC. And during that time, I, had, I became very disenchanted with the federal liberals' policy on the Canadian military. Um, there were a couple of things that happened. One was the cancellation of the H-101 helicopter program. And anybody who's in the Navy here understands that the frigate program was built to use as a platform for the H-101. And I, ho- I know I'm going to get into the weeds here a little bit, but it was just something that, you know, and I, spo- I spoke with commanders of warships. I sp- you know, it was one of those things that I thought was so ill-considered uh, that, you know, it kind of got me thinking about federal procure, you know, military procurement, which gets you into politics and stuff. Um, this was on the heels of, as well, the uh, uh, dissolution of the Canadian Airborne, uh, who my uncle actually was a part of in the Second World War. It was a proud part of the Canadian military, but you may remember the Somalia experience. And I mean, it th- was a horrible, uh, a horrible set of circumstances over there. Cretchen decided to disband the Airborne, which I thought was also ill-considered. Then we started seeing a lot of other things that were going on with the Canadian military. And I I complained about it, you know, to friends and stuff like that. And at the time, and I don't think people re- remember this very well, is that there was a strange kind of a, a, a fracture that would happen in conservative politics. What That's happened right. is the Reform Party had built up strength during the 1990s. Yeah. The Progressive Conservative Party had lost a lot of its uh, mojo, if you will. There was a point when there was only a couple of members uh, in the House of Commons. And uh, they're, they're, Joe Clark had taken over the Progressive Conservative Party, and a guy named Stockwell Day was running for uh, this new party that had essentially taken the Ontario Tories and... The, uh, a, a bunch of uh, the Reform Party members, and they decided to form this thing called Canadian Alliance, okay. which they, I think that the point behind that was to try and expand the geographic base of it, but it was also to say, okay, well, we're not Reform, we're something a little more to the center, we've got this new young guy who seems kind of cooler and whatnot, and he rides jet skis, and it was like, oh my god. Anyway... I, it's also I, the, the the unite the right. Kind well, of thing. that's okay. what it was. It started. Yeah. That's what okay. it was. Yeah. It was a unite. It was a unite the right thing. But the Ontario Tories in the in the West. So as the election was coming up, it was like Joe Clark was really in the doldrums, and it looked like there was no opposition, no really meaningful opposition. The NDP still sort of had its base, but you know you knew that the opposition was going to end up being a Conservative Party. So. My political calculus, as uh, uninformed as it was, at at the time was that, okay, so if, you know, I'm going to run for a center-right party, everybody says, oh, they're crazy right-wing nutbars and stuff. And there there were lots of crazy people on both ends of the spectrum at that time. But at the same time, uh, I thought, okay, well, if they're the likely party that is going to form opposition, Mm -hmm. then maybe that's who I should hang my hat with. The, what I didn't understand was the antipathy among progressive conservatives in Atlantic Canada towards the Reform Party and what it had done. Anyway, so I ran in the 2000 election um, really as a political neophyte, not understanding much of anything about it, and had my ass handed to me uh, commensurately. And 
I, you know, I, I looked at it and I went, well, they, I mean, the, the election was a disaster. Mm-hmm. I mean, Stockwell Day turned into like the, it, it just that was Barney the dinosaur and the. <laughs> The, the if anybody remembers this election, it was the jet ski and there was, you know, a million other things that went bad I, during the election campaign that I don't need to revisit again. PTSD. So <laughs> so um, uh, that happened. And then because of my experience at the CBC and whatnot, I, they ended up after the election saying, well, do you want to come and work in Ottawa for a while and you can do communications work and that sort of stuff. So I did that for a couple of years until my wife said she was going to divorce me if I didn't stop. And I came back. We had like three kids and I was traveling back and forth. So I came back and I spent some time with a uh, public policy think tank here called the Atlantic Institute for Market Studies. And then following that, uh, that sort of gave me kind of the political comms some of the policy foundation. The other part I needed was sort of some of the organizational stuff. So I ended up managing a couple of federal campaigns from 2003 till 2007, and I also worked for the provincial party, kind of doing grassroots stuff. So, yeah, I saw that. And, and you were, yeah, I, I had it here. Um, so you were also assigned with uh, Arnold Diane Finley as well. Yeah. So that happened. That actually happened after um, I'd been working with the, the um, provincial Progressive Conservative Party. Uh, when Rodney McDonald was in power, and then uh, worked that election, and that was a, a no uncertain terms rejection of, uh, or they, let, let's say they they were looking for an alternative, and Daryl Dexter was elected. Right. But because I had been doing so much work on the sort of the organizational side, uh, a guy named Doug Finley, who was actually Diane Finley's husband at the time, but he was also a senior guy in the federal conservative party. The Harper government had been elected at the time, yeah, and yeah. Um, he saw that I had some, I guess, some skills in a certain area. So I, you know, I ended up going to Ottawa and working there for a time. Yeah, cool. That's, yeah, pretty interesting stuff there. So, so that was the only time you actually ran. Everything else was other kind of yeah, other yeah, exactly. Yeah, and other, it was just other stuff that you were involved. I was in, so, I was sort of end. thinking that I might run again at some point, and so what I was looking to do was get a a really thorough understanding of what I was getting myself into. Right. Mm-hmm. But um, when I uh, when I came back to I came back to Halifax for some personal reasons, and uh, I ended up from Ottawa and I uh, ended up moving back here. And then I was fortunate enough to get the gig at News ninety five seven doing talk radio, which I really really enjoyed. I was bummed when I got fired. Trust me. Yeah. But um, I uh, I. I, I, I went from, uh, you know, you sort of have to hang up the partisan stuff. Yeah, of course. Yeah. When you mm-hmm. get into the media. Yeah. So I hung that up for a while and uh, essentially let my memberships lapse and all of that kind of just stuff as you would. Right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. And then um, after leaving uh, News 95.7, I went to, uh, I was fortunate enough to, you know, it was only a few months and CFIB hired me to be the regional vice president down here. So, yeah. And that's a, that again is a you know rapidly nonpartisan environment. You have to work with every right every government. business. I mean, you, some, well, yeah, yeah, yeah person, I mean, yeah. you have to work with all stripes of government, liberal, right. NDP, you know, PC, whatever it is. So, and you have to be able to have some credibility with them. So you can't be seen as a as a partisan, or it makes the job that much more difficult. Yeah, because I mean, yeah, if you're dealing with Atlantic Canada and things like that, you you would have to deal with potentially like. Three different governments at a time, kind of thing, right? Mm. Um, three. There, or, yeah, three. there was there was, a, there was a time when there was three. That's it's two now. So. Mm. Yeah, I mean, but at one point it would have been like NDP, Liberal, and right. Conservative, or PC, whatever, right? right. So, it would. Yeah, you kind of really have to be a chameleon in that sense. Well, you just have to be seen as somebody who's an honest broker, right? Exactly. Because mm-hmm. when you're when you're working as an advocate for uh, an association like CFIB mm. and. <laughs> It's funny because today, the day that we're talking here, I just started my new role with Restaurants Canada. Which yeah, is which ex- we're going to talk about that. Which yeah, is exactly yeah. the same thing. And yeah. you, you need to be an honest broker with um, all governments and the people that you're working with, right? And so you're not coming at this from a capital P political. It, you know, small, it is political, yes, but yeah. it's not partisan. And there's a, yep. there's a distinction there that you have to make. Absolutely, yeah. So... Like you know, at this point, yeah, we know you have. A, you just started a new job. 
which we'll talk about. But uh, is that thought of potentially running there again at any point in time? Or have you like completely said, now nah, that's done? I think I'm getting to a point where it's, you know, um, that it's pretty much done. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's, I would like to see younger, um, you know, I'd like to see newer ideas. I think, you know, it, there might be roles where you'd want a steady hand on the tiller and all of that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, you get to a certain point where it's, it, it's just like, uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. you know, it, uh, it's look. I have all the respect in the world for people who put their name forward for public office, mm-hmm. in, at any level, whether it's a councillor or an MLA or the mayor or the premier or an MP or somebody who's you know running to be prime minister. There, it is an enormous uh, effort at each of those levels in in different ways, obviously. Uh, if you're running, you know, in municipal politics, you don't have all of these sort of partisan uh, components to it. There are there are lots of pol- there's lots of politics involved, but the, you know, at least you don't have the partisan stuff that you have. That and that's you're carrying water for the party sometimes, and it, and sometimes you get tagged with things that you don't like being tagged with. Mm, right. Uh, you know, on the provin- on the provincial side, you know, you're dealing with a uh, multiplicity of issues. Uh, you get you know, large ridings, it's tough. And, and, you know, people talk about, you know, politicians get paid. Politicians don't get paid too much. They do not. In Nova Scotia, I mean, when you look at what, like, an MLA is making, it's like, are you kidding me, man, for the work that they're doing? They should be paid twice as much as that. What does an MLA make? Uh, it's it's starting, 80 grand. It's, okay. it's um, 80, we'll just call it 90. We'll yeah, just sure. call it 90. It's 89 80 and, and change. 80, cool. So that's the base, is about 90 grand. Now, yeah. if you get in cabinet, you make about like another 140 grand or yeah, something. 140, yeah. 140, 130, something like that. And mm-hmm. Premier makes decent money. You know, like that's, that, like, yeah. that's like a low level public service job. Yeah, right. no, no. It's you know you, honestly, you look yeah. at the you look at the sun, have a look at the sunshine list of what like municipal employees Absolute, are getting. No, right? no, no. Listen, I why council like councilors are being paid far below what the amount of work that they do? And I know everybody likes to bitch at councilors and say, yeah, they're, no, they work really, really hard. I, and look, I can argue about whether you know I like what some councilors are doing or not of not course. doing. Yeah, I think that they I think that they should be paid more. I think the mayor makes a decent buck. He's making 180 and change or whatever it is. Yep. You know, the premier's doing okay, you know, but you're leading a province. Right. The MPs are doing pretty well. They're, they, you know, they're making yes. 170 or 180 grand, you know, or uh, if they're uh, not in cabinet. Well, I was going to say, they're making, they're making pretty well. And on top of that, yeah. um, federal politics, uh, if people don't realize it, federal politics is uh, you are in a world that most people don't understand and don't, you can't conceive mm-hmm. because... When you're in Ottawa, and you would know this, I mean, maybe not to the same degree as people in in the actual positions, but you are very rarely spending your own money because you have so many people vying for your interests. You're right. a rock star in Ottawa, and mm-hmm. you spend eight months of the year probably or more in Ottawa. Yeah, I, I just be careful around the idea that, you you know, anybody's paying your way lobbying-wise. There's, there's a pretty high level of transparency in terms of what people oh, can yeah. give you in terms of gifts and all that kind of stuff. You know, yeah, do they go in junkets and yeah, there, you know, there's there's stuff that happens. And but uh, but but by and large, we, we have we have a prime minister not playing bias or anything like that. But we have a prime minister who's had a lot of uh, ethics violations yeah. for getting gifts and things like that. Oh yeah. So <laughs> I'm just saying it's out there. You it's, know, it's it's yeah. a fact that things happen, and you are you know yeah. they make good money. And so either yeah. way, I would say I would say of the three levels of government, the, uh, you know, I I wouldn't be bitching about my salary if I was. Right. Right. Uh, a federal elected official or, or a bureaucrat, for that matter. That, that being because, said, though, extremely tough job. As I said, you're away from your family at like a minimum like eight months away. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, you know what? Um, I will say one thing about this is that a, a, an M, like a, an MLA and a councillor, I think that they have a lot more demands because they're closer to the ground. And people like I agree with you people there. walk up on your front door and go, "Dude, a hundred percent," you know, or "Ma'am," or whatever it might be. Yes. But it, uh, MPs. In, in my experience, an MP, the job is what they make it. It's the same as a senator. Like yeah. a lot of people go, well, what do senators do? We have, some, we have a couple of, you know, like senators that 
I've got a huge amount of time from because they're actually, they actually work really hard. Mm -hmm. And if you don't understand what the Senate does, it's worth reading up about it because the Senate plays a really valuable role. And I know that I could get into long, hard arguments with people about saying that it's a waste of time, but it is not. It, I'm a, I am a believer that the Senate is an important uh, part of our, our democratic process. Yep. But, you know, the, the, the MP and the Senate jobs are are what you make them. Right. Because if you want to be a lazy MP, yes. you can get away with it. Yeah. Uh, if, if you want to be a lazy MLA, you'll only get away with it once. Right. <laughs> you know what no, I, mean? I, I would agree with that. But it just it just seems that like you know broken families and all that stuff just seems so high percentage wise well, yeah, in the federal level. It's it's hard on your personal life and yeah. you know especially I, I I think for reasons other than what are most commonly seen. Like a lot of people when they're getting into politics, they think, well, I don't want you know my personal life drug up or dr dragged up. Pardon me. Uh, I don't want my personal life dragged, uh, you know, into the into the light, or I've got skeletons in my. In Canada, that really doesn't happen that much, you no, know. Unless, mm. like, if you're the prime minister and you've worn blackface, it might. But right. If if, um, but by and large, I think that if uh, you know you're getting into politics, the only time you're going to run into trouble is that if you do something that is uh, ethically questionable while mm -hmm. you're in office. Mm. I don't find, I don't, you know, unless you've done something, you know, deplorable or egregious in your past, you know, whether it's, you know, somebody's Me Too moment or whatever it might be. Right. Um, and if you did do that, then I would suggest that you don't bother running for public office for a variety of reasons, yeah. but, it, but, it, the, but it, unless you've done something, you know, very, very egregious, I, I don't think that in Canada we have the same level of the um, mudslinging. mudslinging that we see yeah. in other yeah. in other political jurisdictions. Anyway, so but where where you brought well, the point you brought up about the personal issues is that it, there is a lot of stress just in the job itself, in the travel, in you know being away, yeah. uh, in you know the focus that you have to apply on it. So yeah, it is t it's tough on young families. I know that. A lot of people have had a, a very tough time doing it. Some people flourish with it, but it, it is challenging. So I will, uh, I'll bring up one thing, because I know your name floats around every once in a while here and there and stuff like that. And uh, there was a little bit of a rumor that maybe uh, there was a, a municipal election in your future <laughs> at some point. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I've, I've talked to people about it. Yeah. Uh, it's, I, I've just, as I told you when I jumped in here today, I've just taken a job. Yeah. Uh, as the uh, VP of Government Relations for Restaurants Canada, that's, I think, where my focus should lie. I've really been yeah. a strong advocate for small business. I think I can do a lot in this role working mm, hugely important. With, go with government to advance the interests of people who are in that particular industry. Um, I have, a, you know, I had a lot of experience at CFIB that I could bring to the table. Uh, there's... You know, the, the other side of this is that as we, you know, we talked today, Mike Savage hasn't said he's not going to run. Right. Uh, who knows, you know, if he is, if he isn't, if he decides to run, the percentage of incumbency victories is such that I wouldn't expect that there's anybody who's going to be able to beat him in an no, election by I any, can't see it. you know, by a long stretch. He's been mm. a good mayor. I've always supported Mike. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think he's, you know, I think he's been a good mayor for Halifax. And I, if he decides to run in another election, I'd be happy to support him again. Yeah. I think he's, you know, he's, uh, he's been good for the city over the long term. Um, whether, you know, if he doesn't run, then, you know, I'm hopeful that there'll be, I know a good slate of candidates that will come forward or some people that will provide, you know, a, you know, a logical um, option, you know, going forward. And that, yeah. uh, so and there is a list of names that are rumored out there. But we won't go down there yeah, at all. Yeah. But You're not taking yeah. on an easy undertaking by any means with this Restaurants Nova Scotia thing either. No. It's a tough Restaur time for rest Restaurants Canada. Oh, restaurants, restaurants Canada. Canada. Yeah. yeah. It's a tough time for restaurants. It's an enormously tough time. And yeah. this was part of the kind of calculus that I had around this is that, you know, there's there are a number of issues that are really challenging for uh, people in the hospitality sector, in the food services business. You know, whether it's you know, and a lot of the stuff I, I, I you know I don't need to go chapter and verse on this. I brought a list of things that I'm focusing on, but I'm not going to get into it too deeply. Uh, but I, I think that there are so many challenges out there that government can help with. Mm -hmm. You know. And uh, I'd like to be a part of finding some of those solutions. 
So yeah, I mean, I I, I I can kind of agree with that. I mean, like I I threw my hat in a, in a municipal election three years ago, and uh, I get often asked like if you know I would do it again, and I, I'm kind of like one. I'm enjoying what we're doing right now, and that's this podcast. The other thing is is that uh, I uh, I don't necessarily like um, painting myself with a color. Uh, I I I'd like to. I mean, not that that happens in the city, but uh, I kind of enjoy the fact that uh, you know. I could work with who's in power at that time to kind of make the community better. I'm in a few different boards and things like that. And I try to work with people, whoever may win the election to get what I want done in the community done. And especially now, even uh, with restaurants, I'm a foodie. We obviously our, our, our podcast supports a lot of local businesses because we try to highlight the, not just where we're recording, but also the breweries and their beers. We do pint of the week and do beer facts we have this obviously where we come here and we record at Old Biddies, which we didn't mention, but I'll mention it right now. So it's 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 things like that. Like we we heavily support that, um, you know, as much as possible. And I agree. Like I think there's something there that uh, that they're offering a valuable skill. I mean, it's it's not just skills and business that they're offering, but it's experience. It's mm-hmm. a form of entertainment for people. Sure. I mean, some people want to go and see a show or a movie or go to a sports game or something like that, but some people honestly just want to go maybe hear a live band mm-hmm. here or like, you know, like someone playing the guitar and having a beer and eating a really great meal. That's a form of entertainment that's like vitally important to the city. Mm-hmm. And it has been for a long time. Yeah. And it we have a we have a great culture in this city, yeah. and and being a representative for Restaurants Canada for Atlantic Canada is going to take me to St. John's, and right, Brook nice. and Charlottetown, and Moncton, nice. and okay. Fredericton, and St. John, and you know Sydney, and so uh, there's lots of, there's lots of opportunity in all of these areas to try and provide environments where businesses like this can flourish. And there's a great relationship that Restaurants Canada has in the uh, beer, wine, and spirits industry yep. because obviously that plays an important role. Um, labor is a big issue. Uh, what are we doing around immigration policy that is yeah. going to make things work better? How do we get a lot of our restaurants through the other side of COVID? Yep. It's still, there are still a lot of hangovers from 100%. The, oh, co- yeah. you know, COVID shutdowns that continue to exist. Yep. So it's, uh, it's just a good time, and it's a great team to be a part of. The guy who used to um, uh, do this job is a very, very dear friend of mine, and I've always, I always admired the work he did, so it's going to be able to, you know, I'm really happy to be able to kind of pick up the torch. His name is Luke Gurdjieff. He was a great, great representative for restaurants here, so I'm looking forward to um, picking up the torch from him and his his successor Richard Alexander, who's now in Toronto. So yeah, I think I think as a, as a team, we're going to be able to offer something useful to people in the industry, and and it and it kind of scratches my edge, right? Yeah. Um, I like having that. I like having that political kind of dynamic. There was to, a, there know? was a time where Matt wanted to do like a food and culture yes. uh, podcast almost exclusively. We almost really? went down that road. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. So who knows? I mean, if you got ideas, uh, you know, you can plug them our way. We'll certainly do an episode I with mean, you yeah. again. And we, we, we can talk a little bit about what we have planned for the future for this thing too. Cause yeah. uh, uh, the afternoon pint uh, doesn't stop here. We yeah. have some other ideas that we plan to expand mm-hmm. on. So, I mean, that's something we can always talk about too. Cause, yeah. Uh, I, I'm a, I'm a hugely I'm, I'm hugely passionate about tourism and uh, you know specifically I mean obviously Nova Scotia but then there's places that you know I've traveled to Europe often to, you know a handful of times and uh, you know and around Canada and things like that and I like to talk about the places that I've been and the things that I've experienced yeah sure right I mean I've had people who who I've worked with in the past who are not from Nova Scotia who have written to me and said like all right here you're, you're the guy to talk to tell me about things that I should do. And I've written out paragraphs and uh, they left and came and came and gone, I guess, or whatever. And I followed up and said, so what did you do? And they were like, oh, everything you told me to. <laughs> and I was like, what? And they're like, yeah, because I, I, what I did was I started them in Halifax. They, you know, they came into the airport, yep. started them in Halifax and basically wrote out an itinerary for them to go to the valley, head down to Yarmouth, like Digby, Yarmouth, and then come back up to the South Shore. And that's what they did. They, they took the week and they did the loop around to like from uh, from Halifax down they said well the next time you come I'll do the northern region <laughs> I'll show you how to get around the Cabot Trail and Cape Breton and everything mm-hmm. so I mean yeah it's a, it's um, it's something I'm very passionate about and so that is something we wanted to and I think we have some ideas for for what we do here that can help celebrate that eventually yeah 
Well, good luck with it. I, I uh, spend a lot of time doing a uh, podcast on my own. I know how uh, difficult it is. It's time consuming, yeah. but it also, you know, it provides, I think it provides a real, uh, it scratched an itch for me just because of the radio thing, but it, but yeah. it, it also provided me with an opportunity to learn a lot of things and meet a lot of people that I never had an opportunity. hundred percent. You know, you know yes. what I mean? Yeah. And uh, I guess on the other side of it, you know, it's, it's been a great opportunity to meet you guys. And, and yeah. I, I wish you the very best in this. I'm sure that Thank it'll you. be successful. Yeah. And I like, I also like to hear that, you know, you've been able to figure out a way to monetize this, like something that I never <laughs> was able to do. So, you know, monetizing it means there's a sustainability uh, potential there. So the beer is now paid for. <laughs> That's right. <yeah. laughs> that was enough. I was going to ask, you know, do, do I have to, yeah. should I leave a tip? Is that, no. Is that, no? Yeah, that's yeah. the thing. So honestly, I think that's a great way to end this. And so, I mean, honestly, thank you very much. It was, it was, uh, I think the only time I either, ever interacted with you before oh. was I called in on the radio. Sorry, we do have to do one more <laughs> shout out to old biddies before I forget. We'll put this at the beginning of the episode, but just in case. Uh, you named oh, the beer yes. we're drinking today, okay, dude. Yeah, How did, tell, real quick about that. So, okay, yeah. So this is um, this is Old Biddy's Smashing Blonde Ale. Uh, Smashing Good Blonde Ale. And so what happened was they were talking about... My wife is a blonde. Smashing Good Blonde. Just so there you know. go. I, you should buy I, some She's, she's, she's <laughs> listening to this, so I know that <laughs> I have to say that. So she... Uh, she'll love this because it's a nice, lighter beer, less than 5%. Um, so the idea... Of, and we put the beer facts up there, but uh, a smash beer is a brewing style, which check out the beer facts to find out what that is. And they were talking about changing it up and they used to just call it like a, their smash blonde. And then they were throwing names out there on Facebook about like, ah, oh, we're thinking about renaming it. We're thinking about just calling it this whenever. And I was like, well, if you like, if it's a smash beer and it's a blonde, why don't you just call it a smashing? And they emphasize the smash part, smashing good blonde ale. And uh, they loved it. They were just like, yeah, that makes that that works. So they were just like, they I, I didn't I didn't think anything of it. They were like, uh, they commented on there and said we're going to take it away. The, you know the powers that be. And the next thing you know, I get a solid post that says thanks, Matt Connard, for the name. Labels are getting printed now. You're a bit of a branding genius. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Afternoon pint genius. S- smashing good blonde ale. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. More importantly, it's a good beer. More importantly, it's a great crushable beer. There we it's go. A smashable yeah. beer. So we can endorse it. <laughs> exactly. Afternoon pint. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Jordy. Thank you very much. Uh, another yeah, quick cheers, cheers with our with our glasses. Yeah. Thank you again. Have a great one. Thanks. Talk soon.